Yeah, uh, my question was, well, you asked right at the beginning, what topic do you want to talk about? Um, and my suggestion for that is, so, uh, what, what is, like, true aspiration? Uh, what is true and total aspiration um, for, for the divine? Um, so, the, some background for that question is that, um, uh, for me, the uh, Sri Aurobindo and the Mother, their teachings are very um, central for me, important for me. And um, in their sort of in, in their yoga, the central thing that is spoken about is basically aspiration, this flame in the heart, and sort of reaching up and reaching up and sort of um, craning up towards the divine with that flame more and more and more, and sort of building that fire. So that's the question. So how how do you really do that? What does that really mean? Um, what is true aspiration? What is true devotion to the divine? This thing that um, is not necessarily easy to know what it is. That's the question. <laughs> no rats, no hyenas there. <laughs> Beautiful question. Very fitting. And I'm glad you referred back to my question at the beginning of what should we speak about. Because that question was obviously not just spoken casually. It's a rhetorical question, question for myself. On the first day of the program, I'm asking this out loud for myself. I'm seeking permission. I'm looking for an opening myself. I have no rights just to come here and pretend that I know the truth and I am speaking this truth. I have to first have a some kind of degree of license given. So therefore, what shall we speak about? And if I really be honest here, without any false pretenses, no about posturing, the most honest thing would have been probably first sit for a whole entire freaking hour not knowing what to say and leave the room quietly. But I know that may be not t uh, taken by all in the same way, you know, because it's not as if we have the luxury of gathering every week, right? We're here for a limited period of time and you're here fully present. So therefore I have to rise to the occasion and say something. So thank you for that. So this, what you're asking, can be responded in, obviously, several ways and in two principal ways. Perhaps I will first give it a kind of scrutiny slash open as the dissecting it, so as to look into the very, very underline of why that is. You know, because obviously, in the case of Shura Rabinda Ghosh and the mother, that was very much in line with the tradition itself, very much in line with a given tradition. That flame, that tapas, right? that quality, is a very Indian thing. It's like the fire of Prometheus that have been carefully held and protected once it was brought down by the Titan to humans as the fire of self-knowledge, because that's what it truly stands for. It has been preserved by the culture.
in different cultures this may be viewed differently. Entrance point is somewhere else, perhaps. But in India in particular, that flame, that spark, is of great significance. And speaking from the view or the perspective of that esoteric anatomy, is because fire is an element without which there is no transformation. Therefore, uh, yoga, if we are to break it down to the elemental order, all yogas, all known to us yogas, always deal with the, these three aspects, represented by the sun, the moon, and the fire. Or rather, we should maybe speak about it in that order, the fire, the sun, and the moon. So, it has respective seeds in the anatomy, in the esoteric, subtle anatomy, respective regions of and respective domains. But the whole process is about that. The whole process is that it's, it's not just, as in Hatha Yoga, the yoga of the solar and the lunar energies. But here, it is as that union of the seer, seeing, and seeing. It's the union of the observer, the process of observing, and that what is being observed. Because that's what here the fire, the sun, and the moon represent. So that fire here, the importance and emphasis on flame, to maintain that flame is very important because without that flame there's no transformation. Fire is in itself stands for the power of transformation. If there is no fire, there is no transformation. Just like if there is no fire, cannot cook food. One can die from starvation when the cupboard or whatever vault full of grain. You can't cook that grain. Fire is required to cook that grain. At all respective levels of life and creation, this is true. So, of course, it is true when it comes to the, this work. So, therefore, flame he is spoken of as that importance to tend to that sacrificial offering where that flame is alive and it is our responsibility to kindle that flame at all times least it will be blown away and we can't afford that hence that poetic emphasis made by Sri Aurobindo's teaching that flame that comes from the heart and reaches to the heaven reaches to the sky so How can that be, or what is the prerequisite, how can, what can one do, what, what's each to their own, it's how one understands this. Again, it's a very cultural thing as well, very cultural thing, and you also, you here we run the danger of kind of uh, messages that begin to conflict. At one point we talked about bliss and all it takes is to relax. You know, we're not relaxed enough. So how can that here be reconciled with the necessity to maintain fire, which kind of like feeling, seems like sluggish attitude would not cut. An opposite of that is required. This is why I say this is very, very, very personal affair. That spark, that flame, is the flame of intelligence, self-effulgent, 
It's the liveliness of consciousness in this temporal experience as being so and so. So it's divine in every way, in, in every respect. But how to turn that flame so that it not just cooks the food in the body when it's offered as nourishment, not just provides mental clarity, which is required on a daily basis, but how to also turn that flame into the way so that it has a much more refined way where that flame not consuming us in all possible ways, because this is another sign of fire. Again, within the given tradition, we are being fried, fried here by our desires, insatiable sense for self-gratification. All these are in the domain of fire element anyway. So how to turn this fire for it to reach heaven? is what this job is about. How to direct this fire, how to make sure that this flame is not just some kind of act of vanity, where we literally consume the very precious opportunity, instead of being consumed in that precious opportunity. And one can be consumed for, tr for trivial things, and one can be consumed in the flame of divine light. In both cases, there is an act of being offered. In one case, that consummation, that being consumed here, is consumed for nothing. In other words, wasted. In another, it's that what fire here does the best, being transformed. But once this intelligence rises, it knows how to feed itself. And one also knows when one is given to tendencies. All it requires is self-discipline and honest self-introspection. With that sense of self-introspection, we can very quickly acknowledge when are we being wasteful here with this precious flame, when it is just being used for nothing. It burns, incinerates, just as those seeds. You know, you can just lightly roast the seeds, lightly roast nuts, which will increase their flavor and make it even more palatable. A moment after, and it all burned. Burned. That's the power of fire. Working with fire requires tremendous sense of attention, tremendous sense of responsibility. And of course, being fire, it means it needs to be fed. That's what it means, rekindling it every day. It needs to be fed. Oblations need to be offered into it. So you might have heard us speaking about the importance of the tapas of that spark of divine intelligence, that certain spiritual discourses can dampen and blow away that, especially the invitation to get away with the search prematurely, which is 
a common thing in new Advaita and in so-called non-duality. Very common. That spark is barely there. Needs to be tendered yet. Carried like this. So it becomes sufficient onto itself. Strong enough. So it can actually begin to do the transformative work. Assist that. Instead someone comes and blows on it. Because they think that the person is ready for nirvana. And what we end up with? Wasted, complete opportunity, wasted. That's the downside of everything goes. Mixing apples and pears. Bringing the highest spiritual discourse of the highest degree, which is requires one to be cooked. There's no flame needed anymore. That's the time when you turn off the gas. That's the time when you switch off the knob. Because it's like, mm, delicious. So, Tend to that fire, tend to that flame. And remember that anything that is offered into it wholeheartedly, that's what sustains it more than anything. And everything is worthy for that oblation. Everything. Everything. So there can be a great degree of discrimination of what you want to offer. Or you go by the way of everything is sacred, therefore everything offered is worthy of ablation. And I'm offering that into that fire. I'm offering even all my all my sense of idiosyncrasy, all my imperfections, all my limitations, all my weaknesses, I'm offering into that fire. I'm offering that what may seem not deemed worthy of being offered. But if I do that consciously, then that what makes the fire sparks more. Because it rejoices each time something offered genuinely. It's better to offer nasty stuff genuinely than the best of goods in the act of cold, ritualistic enterprise. It makes no difference whatsoever. Fire will consume it anyway because that's the power of fire. It will set a blaze on anything. But when you offer that, wholeheartedly, in your daily life, as you go through your daily interactions, through your daily ups and downs, that's what sustains that tapas. You might be a busy householder and you will not even make it to your altar because other things need to be tended first. In most people here in this room, that is the case. A luxury few, a few who can actually begin their day and end their day with a place and space composed enough to do this. And one can be finicky about, you know, and can pot around. You know, down this way, but if you have to get going about your daily life, engagement, and responsibilities. What can we found out last night? Right? We can term the kitchen duty. Yeah. Into... Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I'm saying kitchen because it's kind of considered to be the, the least exciting part. Not cooking, but cleaning. Any kitchen in any life situation can be offered. The least favorite activity can be, can feed that tapas. Tapas is also has another word in English translation, is called spiritual ardor. That's what that flame that Sri Aurobindo and the mother talked about is. It's a late motive of whole Indic spirituality, that ardor, ardorous, passionate. Passionate about that what is the most sacred. But what is the most sacred is for each and every one to find out in their own way, unique, intimate to each and every one. So as to not make pretenses, so as not to cover it all with one blanket. When that ardor is strong enough, it's indistinguishable. You can submerge it into the sea, into the water, and it will not be extinguished. like that fire that burns and the water. Because it reached a different level. It's no longer a simple flame. It's the luminosity that your own heart emits from the deepest cavern of your being. That is the true meaning of that flame, of that arm. It's the way of life, so it's no longer a prerequisite. It may have started as a prerequisite and become a late motive. And blessed are those whose life is illumined by that light. <laughs> 